Hey, y'all. Welcome to Trials to Triumphs. I'm Ashley Blaine Featherson Jenkins, but we're friends, so you can call me ABFJ. This week, I've been thinking a lot about pivoting. There's an art to it, especially when you're someone like me who thrives on structure and daily planning. If it ain't on the to-do list or on my calendar, it's likely to stress me out, and it certainly doesn't add to my productivity. But allowing myself to pivot allows me to be open to what else could be for me. But everything important isn't on a to-do list. And knowing this allows me to be surprised by the miracles and blessings that are simply a pivot away. My friend Robin Thede knows all about the power of the pivot and the blessings she's reaped from it are incredibly inspiring. She's one of the greatest creators of our time and Black women, she's doing it all for us. I'm super excited for you all to hear how she took matters into her own hands and created the life of her dreams. Oh and she's no stranger to helping the dreams of others come true too. And at the end, Robin sticks around to answer some Afrofuturism questions in our Sankofa moment. Who is your throwback crush? When I say throwback, I'll give you an example. I live for Booker T. Washington, (laughs) and I'm living for Benjamin. (laughs) Go away! Robin, welcome. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. I adore you. And let me tell you one of the reasons why. Uh You, to me, um, embody community. Uh, Do you remember when we first met? In person. Yes. In New York. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So, it's funny. I went back, went through all of our DMs, and our first— Wait, was it in New York? Wait a minute. Maybe I— Okay, you're going to have to tell me because okay. I, I have a different recollection. So, okay, oh, tell see, me. oh, I love this. I love it when there's like different recollections. Yeah. My fa- <laughs> it's my favorite thing because it's like whose truth is the truth. But and anywho, yours is, I'm sure. <laughs> so this is this is when I think of my introduction to the Robin Thede world, this is what it was. <laughs> we were, you know, like friends, you know, on Instagram, you know, supporters, yeah. you know, rooting, rooting for one another on Instagram. And, you know, I was a huge fan of yours. And um, I had posted that I was going to New York. At the time, it was top of March 2016. I was going to New York to shoot my very first pilot for CBS, uh, <gasps> which in turn oh, led— yes. 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 I yes, remember Robin. all of this. I Can we say what it is? Because I remember— it was the Drew pilot. Yep, Nancy yes, Drew. Yes, yes, it was the Nancy yes. Drew pilot, and you had to go to Brooklyn to get your hair done. Okay, okay, all right, I'm <laughs> spoiling the story. And we went to dinner. I do remember all yes, of this. Yes, yes. But yes. this is what's beautiful about it. So it was a very traumatic experience, one that I'm very grateful for. But yes, I was in New York, completely like a fish out of water. And, yes. uh, but also at a time in my life where I was just so excited to like do this pilot. I was like, oh, I'm going to be a TV star. It's going to change my life. Oh my gosh. Uh, and so you had, I had, I think put out, you know, uh, asking for people to send me hairstylists or whatever, whatever yeah. they could. Cause I, y'all, they didn't know what to do with my hair, but yes, you were like, oh, immediately. Oh my gosh. Here's my number. Hit me up. Anything you need, I got you. I hit yeah. you up. I was staying on the Lower East Side at the 60 Hotel. You know, I was feeling yep. fancy. And I hit you <laughs> up. And immediately, you were like, oh, what are you doing tonight? Meet me at such and such in Brooklyn or whatever. My friend's doing a, uh, I think it was a book signing or an art exhibit. It was something. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, I think it was an art thing. Cultured. Yeah. It was very cultured. <laughs> And I was like, yes. And 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 I admired you so much. So I thought it was so sweet that you had never met me in person. We're like, come through. Then it was a whole adventure. You were like, do you have to shoot tomorrow or anything? And I was like, no. You're like, all right, well, you're coming out with me. We went out. We got cute yep. food with friends. <laughs> yep. It was, you know, you introduced <laughs> me to people. It literally felt like we were instant friends. You know, like I said, I, when I think of you, Robin, I think of community. Um, and wow. that is 
a beautiful person to be. So I love and adore you, and I'm so happy you're here. Well, uh, thank you. I, I thank you for telling me your side of how you remember that went down. Because <laughs> here's what I remember: I remember we had mutual friends. So I want people listening to this to not think it's okay to just reach out to me and I'll take you on a night on the town. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I was. I no, was no, no, vetted. But, but I was vetted. Had, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You were vetted. We had mutual friends, but but we didn't know each other at all. And um, I'm so glad that I could be a tiny part of a good memory for that. Oh, yeah. Like when I think of that time in New York, I think of you and the beginning of our friendship. Aww. So it's it's pretty, yeah. it's pretty cool. What's cool about you, Robin, is that you're all of the things that in a lot of ways are tough. An actor, you're a writer, you're a producer, you're a host, you're a voiceover actor. You're a comedian. You're all of the things, but these are all things that people feel as they feel as though they can have an opinion about. So, yeah. what is that like for you? Yeah, I think you're right. Comedy is very subjective, right? Like even now, we're um, making a black lady sketch show on HBO, and uh, this show is sketch is hard, right? Like if you watch SNL or, or my show or any show, <sighs> there's going to be sketches that you like more than others. I mean, hopefully on ours, you like all of them. And, and, and you know, comedy is really subjective. And I think a lot of people um, think that they can have an opinion because they're like, well, if it didn't make me laugh, then I need to tweet about that. Or I need to like drag it through the mud. Yeah. Um, and I think that is something that you have to grow a thick skin with with comedy. I mean, everything, if you do stand up, you're used to people heckling from the audience. If you make things for digital, you're used to people dragging you in the comments. If you make stuff for TV, you're used to Twitter, you know? So it is what it is. But I'm like, hey, if they're commenting, they're watching. So I think that's always a good thing. And I think you can't worry about pleasing everyone. You have to believe that what you're doing is elevating the art in some way that's valuable. And as long as you're doing that, it's always going to work. That's interesting to me, Robin, because I'm curious if you were always that way? Like, were you always able to take the comments, take the criticism and let them roll? Okay, so how did you get there? I think just by practice. I Mm. think, you know, when you, when I started, so the first show that I created and got on TV was The Rundown with Robin Thede. Yes. On BET. It was my late night show. And I think, I, I will say this though, from all the shows I've created, people have been pretty kind and they've all been done done well yeah. in, for their own measurements. So they're all like 100% on Rotten Tomatoes. But then there's people who go on and they're like, this show sucks, you know, whatever. So I think after years of that, you just kind of go, oh, okay, that's just going to come with the territory. You don't put too much stock in people hating the product, but you also have to balance Um, And you talk about joy a lot and figuring out how to find that for yourself and your purpose and all of these things that you've been talking about about for years. But for me, I realized that my purpose was not to make people happy, but to provide entertainment that's joyful and they can do with it what they want, you know? And I think where my responsibility stops is in making people happy because I can't do that. I can't be responsible for that. That's that's too much, right? I'm not God. That's too much. So all I can do is do my best work put it out there with joy and positivity. And so I like to uplift. And I think that there's there's beauty in our visibility in the comedy space. And the yeah. more chances we take, the more we break those doors open to be able to do silly stoner comedies or like I'm making a zombie movie, a zombie comedy at Amazon right now. Like, yeah, I you know, love zombies, um, by the way. I'm, I'm obsessed with zombies. Yes. They're so I'm interesting. I'm making a movie. <laughs> Listen, I'm making a movie at Amazon called Killing It. It is it is Shaun of the Dead meets Girls Trip. And yes. it is unbelievable. <laughs> and these four Black women who dropped out of Spelman their senior year go back to homecoming to avenge their tarnished reputations and Atlanta gets taken over by zombies. So, you I'm know, obsessed. that press release is out, so I can say it. That's but, um, my but dream yeah, we're, movie. We're I'm obsessed. That. Obsessed. That's hilarious. Well, you might have to be in it. <laughs> Yes, I love it. But that's why, right? That's why you kind of just get over it because you're like, I just have to keep working. And there's going to be people that love it and there's going to be people that hate it, but you have to just keep making the work and keep yourself to a really high standard. Because if I start tailoring my work based on the people that hate it, I won't have anything to make, you know? <laughs> yeah. So, but it's there's almost, far more people who are positive. 1,000%. But it, for me, what I got from that is like, you had to give yourself grace. You had to say, oh, yeah. listen, 
I'm not for everybody. My art is maybe not for everybody, but I'm for me. And that's enough. That's enough, you I'm know? For, I'm for me and the Black women I'm trying to represent, right? Amen. I can't represent all Black women, but I, I for damn sure came, especially with the sketch show, to, for a much altru- much more altruistic purpose. I was like, why are we over here trying to beg these white sketch shows to put us on? Why don't I just make that platform that can be our legacy? And I'm so proud of that. It's like definitely the proudest thing in my career, for sure. Because well, it's so much bigger than me. Yeah, but I'm We've had over a hundred guest stars. Which is in brilliant. It, all You're black. going to have a third season. <laughs> it's only in three seasons. You know what I mean? Like In that. three seasons, over a hundred guest stars, all black people and mostly black women. And we have so much further to go. Like, we still got to get you on the show. Like, we have so yeah. much further to go. And there are so many of us. And I love... Knowing that, like, Quinta Brunson came from a Black Lady Sketch yeah. show. Z-Way, who has her own show on Showtime, was a writer on my late night mm. show. All these people, you know, have come through through my projects, and hopefully I will go through theirs. So, you, you know, you mentioned, you know, really wanting to create the space for yourself and for our peers, right? Um, and that's what birthed a Black Lady Sketch show. But in hearing you say it, it sounded easy. Like you saying it, like you know, I I didn't I didn't see it, so I just created it. But I know it wasn't. <laughs> I know it was right. incredibly right. difficult. So w- tell me a little bit about that experience, because you know, even yeah. for me as a content creator, I we have these ideas that we know are worthy of being. Mm you know, on screens or in people's homes. But the road to get there always seems like Ooh. this should not be this hard. I can see the void in the in the market space, in the industry. Why can't this content just be plugged in? Now, a Black Lady Sketch show is now plugged in, but what was the journey to get it plugged in? It is funny because when we first um, premiered, people were like, why hasn't this been a thing before? This is the first time ever in 2019 in the history of the world. <laughs> um, and and to be fair, there was a Black woman-led uh, UK sketch show called Three Non Blondes or something, but I don't think it was... I, I don't know who all involved was Black. I know there were Black women in the cast. But in terms of American sketch comedy, and, and by and large, this is the biggest high-profile sketch comedy show that's, you know, created by, written by, starring, produced by, blah, 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 Black women. Mm-hmm. So, no, it wasn't easy. Um, I had actually sold it, and I wasn't going to be in the cast initially because mm. I was doing my late-night show on BET. I sold it to another network and other than HBO, and they, for six, seven months while I was making my late night show, we just kind of went back and forth on the budget. But the thing that outsiders may not know to the industry is that sketch comedy is notoriously very cheap. Mm-hmm. Uh, the budgets are really, really small. But I wanted to make something much more cinematic. So the network that we had sold it to just wasn't quite getting me mm-hmm. there with the money. And because I had been head writer, creator, executive producer on a bunch of shows, I was like, oh, I know what I need. You know, so this is 20 years, almost 15, 15 years in the business of working my way up as a producer and show creator that taught me how to learn about budgets and how to allocate money and how much I can make a show for what cameras I need to use. Like, so I knew all of that by the time I sold this show. So anyway, in July of 2018, my late night show got canceled and Issa Rae called me and said, Congratulations, your show got canceled. Now what are we making together? Yeah, Because we had been talking about making television together. <laughs> and she had her deal at HBO, and I didn't have my Warner Brothers deal yet. And so I said, well, you know, I have this sketch show. And it's at a network, but I think the deal's going to fall through because they won't give me the money that I want. So she said, bring it to HBO. And I already had a relationship with the executives at HBO, but they, I had never sold them anything. So long story short, we went to dinner. They bought it at the dinner. I never wrote a pilot. I never shot a presentation. They sent me straight to series. What? I didn't even have a cast. I didn't even have a cast. I told them who I wanted to get, and I luckily got those people. Wow, um, Robin. Yeah. They sent me straight to series six episodes, and it was on within nine months, and then got immediately nominated for three Emmys for a season. It's crazy. It's crazy. Viral, sketches viral in the millions on YouTube, you know, big ratings. And we're on Friday nights. You know, we're on late night on Fridays. Like, we're on late. 
This was before HBO Max. So you have yeah. to think about that. It was before HBO Max. It was just traditional HBO. And um, and we were doing, you know, millions of viewers um, on TV alone. And then our, we, we upload some of the sketches to YouTube. Some people think we're a YouTube show, which is weird. But, like, it's just because we <laughs> upload some of the sketches okay, to YouTube. Okay, I was like, it's a thing. But you know what's funny? Even about that, when I was making the deal with HBO, I said, uh, the thing, I said, I have this out of the other network. I, here are the things I need. And it really wasn't financial because sketch is going to cost what sketch is and it's always going to be notoriously, you know, at a certain financial level. And that's fine. But I said, I want to make a cinematic show and I want Black people to be able to watch it. And Black people don't have HBO like white people at <laughs> HBO because they didn't at the time. <laughs> and so I was like, I need to put at least three sketches a week on YouTube. So I'm mm. not going to put the whole episode up, but I need to put at least three. To, and I'm telling you, it's going to help generate, you know, viewer and viewers and it's going to pull people to HBO. And now, oh my God, now that we have HBO Max, people are like, I only got HBO Max to see this show in Insecure, you know? And it's so, yeah. I love that. So, so it's been a journey, but um, in a way it was easy, but it, it was only easy because of a culmination of many, many years in this business and knowing the worth of the show mm. I wanted to make, mm. knowing exactly what it was going to look like, knowing exactly who I was going to cast, and knowing I knew how to make this show. It, you know, I what we have in common, and I always say, is that, um, you know, my career is dedicated to Black women. And I'm yeah, unapologetic same. about that. And obviously you yeah. are too, because you named your show a Black Lady Sketch Show, which literally leaves <laughs> nothing to the imagination. No we know, yeah, we know exactly <laughs> what the show is about. But with, you know, to me, well, no, I'm not going to say that. To me, it's not a bold name. But to the mm. industry, to the yes, world, it was. it was probably yes. audacious. They were probably like, who is this lady thinking she can just Very. call it a Black Lady Sketch Show? Who do you think she Very. is? So were there talks about that? Was that like a discussion? Oh, was there yeah. a pushback? Talk to me about that. Yeah. You know, Issa and I had a conversation about it, and I kept calling it The Black Lady Sketch Show. That's how I was just referring to it. So it was called The Untitled Black Lady Sketch Show or mm -hmm. something like that. And then we just called it, and then we dropped Untitled. We just kept calling it The Black Lady Sketch Show. <laughs> Mind you, we're making season one, and we don't have a title. We just keep calling it The Black Lady Sketch wow! Show. And so, <laughs> so... We're making it, and, and HBO's like, is it going to be like the Robin Thede sketch show? Is it going to be da-da-da? And I was like, no, 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 this is about the ensemble. Like, I really don't want it to be like my sketch show and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I said to Issa, I said, <laughs> <laughs> I said, I think I just want to keep this name. And she goes, you can't, you can't call it the Black Lady Sketch Show because then somebody's going to be like, who's Black Lady? Not my Black Lady. This ain't my Black Lady Sketch Show. <laughs> and I said, I said, you're right. What if I call it a Black Lady Sketch Show? So it's just one of many that should be out there. So it's just A. It's not the, it's just A. And then we leave the door open for other ones to come. And then we also still take the pride in saying, you won't see black ladies when you tune in. The other thing was, I wanted to joke, at one point we talked about calling it the All-American Sketch Show so that when white people tuned in, they would see all black people and be very <laughs> confused. <laughs> That's actually brilliant, actually. But it, it sounded too patriotic for me and I wasn't feeling it. So I was just like, no, it's a black lady sketch show. And I also like it because if you say, I'm watching a black lady sketch show, they'll be like, oh, which one? A black lady sketch show. Which sketch show? A black lady sketch show. You know, so there's that who's on first joke too. But yeah, that's that's how the title happened. Wow, but <laughs> I mean... For me, but no I, real pushback. No real pushback. After I decided, HBO was like, "All right." But that's what it's for me. This the 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 journey to a black lady sketch show is the journey of going where you are celebrated, not tolerated. Ooh, right? Say that. Leaning on, not only leaning on, but being transparent with people who you know have a shared vision. You share a vision with, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I know that's who Issa is for you. Issa's yes, that for, for sure. so many of us, you know? And mm -hmm. so that is the beauty of this story is that, you 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 know, you're trying to figure out with this other network, six, seven months, you knew what, what type of budget this show deserved. Yeah. And rather than getting scared or panicking or, or just saying, you know what, I'm, I'm going to sign it. I just don't want them to take the show away. I'm just going to do it. Well, what if nobody else takes it? You said, if this ain't where it's supposed to be, it's not where it's supposed to be. But I know yeah. that this is supposed to be on TV, and it is, and it is 
a mainstay, and it is so important. And the, I'm just so grateful that I'm learning the heart behind it because it makes yeah. sense why it works. Is because it came from such an authentic place. It did. Place, it did. Thank you for saying that. And and you know what I will say. That's why when it happened, it happened so fast. Yeah. And Issa, you know, said, look, this is your show. I'm just slapping my name on this because I want people to know that, like, you know, it's the real deal. And there's an argument to be made that I could have made the show without her. And I will say to the other network's credit, they matched the money that HBO gave us. Awesome. And it's not all about money, right? Yeah. So they came up and they were like, oh, oh, somebody else wants it? We'll come in. And so then I had two... Equal offers on the table, but the difference was Issa. Yeah. And the difference was we had a Black executive at HBO at that time. Like, we just had, like, a really— We had a few. Sorry. We had a few. Um, mm. And that was really important to me because mm. I didn't want to be given notes by people who didn't look like me. Yeah. And so—and that's a very privileged thing to say as a showrunner and a producer because that is very rare. Um, and that's why exactly what you're saying, this was just meant to be. So, you know, there's this transitional moment that happens in your career where it's like one moment you're hoping that the gates will open for you. And mm -hmm. then you realize that you are in the position where you can open gates for mm. others. Mm -hmm. What was that transition like? What Were you gratitude filled? Was it, was it a little scary? Were you hoping that you were going to be able to do it? Uh, yeah. What was that moment like? Was it a huge moment of accomplishment? You know what's interesting? I think that moment for me was on the nightly show with Larry Wilmore. I was a, mm. the head writer on that show on Comedy Central and also a correspondent. And the moment happened for me when I first started the job because Larry said to me, okay, get packets and resumes and hire your writing staff. And I was like, wait, I have like 14 jobs to give to people. That was wild to me. I mean, on Queen Latifah's show, I was head writer and I could hire people there too, but it was a smaller staff and kind of a different environment. But um, I was just given all of this responsibility to hire and the, the privilege of hiring all these people. And I was so excited to hire Jordan Carlos and Holly Walker and, and Francesca Ramsey and all these yeah. Black folks who came in and just made that show so great. And... Um, and also putting them on air, right? We had nothing but uh, people of color correspondents, you know, Latinx and Black correspondents, which was great. And that was different from the Daily Show era, by and large. And 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 yet John Stewart was our executive producer, so I got to learn a lot from him too. So I think the moment for me was when I got to start hiring people legitimately, like, on my own. And just got to say, these are the people I want to hire. And they were like, great. And then when I did my own late night show, I got to hire all the departments as well, right? And now I get to hire every like hundreds of people um, and then continuing that into the sketch show. But there's something about giving each other jobs, giving yes. our people jobs that is so fulfilling. It has become so much less about me. But the funny thing is I've become more visible on camera, even though I've been focusing on putting more people on camera. It's interesting how the boomerang of the rewards comes back. <laughs> it is interesting, actually. I, I'm curious, you know, sister to sister, how do you prioritize your mental health while still staying hungry and ambitious and, and going after your dreams? How do you, how do, you do you it? You know what? So this is a tricky question for me because it's very rare that I have personal time to, like, mm. kick it, right? Like, even this weekend, I'm going to work on a project that I'm writing and just kind of hole up in an Airbnb, you know? And so there's a lot of solitary time when I'm not working, but I am currently working obviously on many things, but, <laughs> but I try to balance self-care by one hiring people. I want to be around every day because I spend so much time at work that I love. I was just doing an interview the other day with the women in media center and they were like, do you realize a Black Lady Sketch Show has the highest number of Black women on staff? And I go, yes. Of any mm. other show on television. I go, yes. That's mm. intentional. <laughs> yeah. Everywhere, behind the scenes, behind the scenes from PAs all the way up to showrunner are 90% Black women. Some of the crew is where you get a lot more white men, but we're working on that too. We got Black women in our camera department, our mm. transport department, like our sound department. Like we, we you're going to see Black people in every department on my show. But um it's because I like coming to work and feeling like 
I'm, I don't know. I'm working around people Me that too. Yeah. value the things I value. Yeah, I know you do. I know you relate to this. Oh, yeah. But we've we've been very privileged to work in environments like that for you on Dear White People and other projects. Like, it, you've been very privileged and you know what it's like working on shows it's that so are so different. Like that. It's so incredibly different to the and point where that's it's like, it traumatic. It is. It, it really well, is. Robin. That's trauma to me. And so self care is working with people who don't make me feel trauma at work because Ooh. I find it. I, I say this before. I've said this before and I'll say it again. If you work at a place as the only black person, you're working in an environment of violence. Mm. You just are. And I don't mean physical violence, hopefully, but emotional warfare that you have to deal with every day, just from people saying, oh, I like your braids. How do you get your hair like that? Like, you just can't hear that every day. And I know that people think that that's, oh, woe is me. It's just words. But it wears on you when you're constantly othered and constantly spoken about in a way that makes you feel like you don't belong. And, you know, and I'm saying this from a position of very much um, you know, light skin privilege and somebody who's established in the business and somebody who's a, a pretty typical body size, you know? And so if I felt those things, I know what my, you know, what what the various women along the spectrum of of shades, sizes, abilities, et cetera, are, are going through in our community. And I, I just have so much sympathy for that. Um, you know, I was raised by a family of black women, so I don't, Yeah. Uh, why wouldn't I give back in that way? So for me, that's self-care. And then, um, I also think that my family is really important to me. My dad is, um, suffering with Parkinson's, wow. um, and I don't live near him. So I make, you know, time to make sure I'm FaceTiming with them daily, usually. Um, and my nieces and nephews, some of them are out here in California, um, but I just really, especially since the pandemic started, really started prioritizing as much family time as possible, seeing them as much as I can, but also like just engaging more in real ways, even if it's over FaceTime. That's really important to me to just feel the roots, right? You know, yeah. just to feel those roots in the ground. I love that you you mentioned that because, you know, when you mentioned your dad, I got a little misty eyed because I'm a daddy's girl, you know. My family is everything to me, just like you. So tell me about Davenport. Tell me about Iowa. What did what did <laughs> Davenport girl? What did Davenport? No, I really want to know, Robin, because you I, nobody in the world would think that you are from Iowa. Okay. I know. I, I know. don't know anybody from Iowa. You're the only person I've ever met from there. I know there's obviously <laughs> tons of people, but to me it's only you. So <laughs> but but where you're from. I don't care who you are, informs in some way, shape, or form yeah. who you are. So what did Davenport, sure. Iowa teach you? Listen, I grew up in a trailer park in Davenport, Iowa. My parents, my dad was a teacher. My mom was a librarian in the school system. They made no money. We were on welfare, even though they were public servants. We got food baskets donated to us from the church. We had to sift out the weevils and the flour. This is just, we had government cheese, you know, all that shit. Mm-hmm. So, um... But the only reason why I was raised there is because my mom got a scholarship to a very, like, white college in Iowa. My mother's from uh, Chicago. So she got a scholarship, went to this all-white college, met my dad, who's a white man. And he was like, who is that woman with the afro? I need to marry her. And they've been married. (laughs) Oh, my God. I think their 50th anniversary is this year. Yeah, it is. No, 74, 74. 48 years this year. Okay. okay. So, um, but they, they're they they're still best friends, but they, and they're still married. Uh, but, but yeah, I think, so then they settled halfway between Chicago and that school. And that happened to be Davenport, Iowa, which is on the Iowa, Illinois border. So it's like two and a half hours from Chicago. So what did Davenport give me? A lot of torture. Mm. We were the only black kids in my elementary school, but in my junior high, it was like 30% black, which was way more than I was used to. So I was like, ooh, yay, Black people. Because what we would do every summer was go to the south side of Chicago, 86 and Oglesby, where my mm. grandmother had a house, around the corner from where Michelle Obama grew up, like literally a block away. Wow. And uh, yeah, and so we spent summers on the south side of Chicago, even though we lived, you know, the rest of the year in in Iowa. So that was a great thing that my mom did. Because obviously, especially when we were in elementary school, it just wasn't a lot of Black kids there. 
Um, so, you know, for us, my mom was like, what am I, how am I raising these children? Like, yeah. you know, in this trailer park. But there was nothing she could do about that because they didn't have money. So, you know, she just made sure that we had the time with our family. Um, and, and that was really valuable to me. And Chicago became really important to me. And I moved there when I was 17 to, to go to college at Northwestern and then Second City. At 17, mm-hmm. I was ready to go. There wasn't a lot for me in Iowa. I knew I wanted to be in the business. Um, I was doing sketches back then on my old camcorder. So you knew early on, like me. I was an early on, like, oh, I yeah. never wanted to do anything else. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, I wanted to be on Saturday Night Live from the yeah. time I was like eight years old. Yeah. So that's the other thing about this sketch. I was like, it didn't just come out of nowhere. Like, I auditioned for SNL a decade ago. I didn't make it. Like, this is, I've been in 20 sketch groups, most of them all Black women. So this is like earned over a career. Like, you know, I didn't just show up and know how to play hundreds of characters. Like, I've been working on it since I was 13 years old. But it did take a career long. I couldn't have done that at 22. HBO wasn't going to buy a show for me at 22. (laughs) (laughs) Even though I thought I could have done it, I had to be ready. Yeah, I had to be ready. You look back and you're like, what would, I didn't even want to show, that show wouldn't have worked. That show wouldn't have Never. made, you know, I even that pilot I was shooting in New York when I met you, like, if I did that, if that had gotten picked up, I wouldn't have been able to have been Joelle and Dear White People. Yep. So I want to ask you, Robin, what is one piece of advice that has really gotten you through the fire? Mm. Well, I'll say that no matter how talented you are, it still requires work. And every level you get to requires more and more work. I remember thinking in an acting class 20 years ago, if I could just be a series regular. I remember auditioning auditioning for the game and getting so close. And I was like, oh man, if I could have just been a series regular, my whole life would be cool. Mm. And then I, and then now as a person who's a series regular, I'm like, oh, there's way more work involved than I was ready to do <laughs> at that time. It really is. It really is. Like I, I was not ready. I was mm. not ready because I wasn't ready in my self-confidence and I wasn't ready in my belief in myself. I knew I was talented, but I didn't understand how to navigate the insecurities that come with being an actor and having people tell you you're not good and so you don't deserve to be paid, which is essentially what every audition was, you know? And mm-hmm. and then I had to learn that in truth, it wasn't that at all. That just wasn't for me. Mm-hmm. And that really is the truth. I think the best single, sum it up in a quick sentence advice that I've heard recently is from Natasha Rothwell, who said, don't be perfect, be prolific. Ooh. And that blew me away. Don't be perfect, be prolific, which means you don't have to beat yourself up for every small failure or even every big failure, as long as you're leaving a legacy that you're proud of. And that was really, really, really amazing to me um, to hear. And it just shook me to my core when she said that. So I think about that now, because even in success, you're always trying to catch that next big fish, whatever it is. Um, and I think we're not patient enough with ourselves once we have been on Dear White People on a Black Lady Sketch Show and all these things. Then it's like, now you're like, oh, what's next? What's next? What's next? Everybody's, they're going to forget about me if I'm not on something. And it's not true. And I think you just have to trust that that the things that are meant for you come come easily, but as a result of hard work, if that makes any sense. Yeah, that's so good, Robin. I It's making me think, I, I like to... Uh, close out with like what we're each taking away from this conversation. Mm. Uh, mm. And I'll share mine. What, I, what I'm taking away is getting close is a win. Oh, I needed sure. to hear that because I am so incredibly hard on myself. I'm my, mm-hmm. I'm my worst critic. I am so tough on myself. But it's the reminder of, you know, it's like what they say, you are kind of who you're surrounded by. If I'm surrounded by such wonderful, prolific, intentional people, and they're in turn surrounded by my energy and my spirit, then there's no way that I can fail. Getting close means that I am closer to whatever I want. Uh, whatever the goal is. And and I really, I just, I, it's, it's, I'm like having a mind blown moment because 
I can't dismiss those beautiful moments. It wasn't for me, but that means that something else is around the corner. And, you know, to me, you, your life, your career, and, uh, you know, the legacy that you are building and creating is evidence of that. And I'm so grateful that you are someone who is in my orbit. And your wins are legitimately my wins, Robin. Yeah, 1,000%. One Same. billion percent. I was jumping up and down when you got nominated for that Emmy. Like, I got nominated for my first <laughs> Emmy. It's true. I, I promise to goodness. I'm screaming. I'm calling you. I'm I calling believe Quinta. that. It's, it's the I truth. Know. And it feels so good. And I, I just, I'm just so grateful for your light, for your spirit, and for everything you're doing for us. Us. Well, All caps with a period. Um, yeah. Yeah. Black so black with a capital B. Listen, yes. I, I feel the same way about you. And thank you for saying it. I receive all of that. It just warms my heart. I But that's what we have to be. That's what we have to be in this industry if we're going to make it. Because if you spend your time bitter and jealous about what other people are doing, it only affects you. It only hurts you. That other person is not thinking about you. And, and not in a bad way, right? They're just doing their grind and they're beating themselves up over things. And it's just a wasted effort. So the thing I'm going to take away is what you said about looking at things in retrospect mm. and saying thank you for the things you didn't get. If I would have gotten SNL, I never would have created history. Mm. I never Woo! would have created a Black lady sketch show. <sighs> we would have still never had this platform. And all of these women who have come through and men and people of all ages, all sizes, all looks. I mean, it's really important to me. Angela Bassett told me, I did the show because you asked and you knew I could be funny. And no one has ever thought that about me. Mm. Angela Bassett. <laughs> and then wow. she got nominated for an Emmy for her performance <laughs> on the show, you know? Yeah. It's like, it's like, yeah, so her first big comedic thing, she gets nominated for an Emmy for. And it took a Black woman showing her. Yvette Nicole Brown said the same thing. I've been on TV for decades, and she said it took a Black woman putting me on her show to get me nominated for an Emmy. Wow. And that's what we have to do, and that's it. That's the thing that keeps me going. That is my radical self-care. That is my reward as I'm doing this work. It's so beautiful to see, and I hope we just continue to be able to do that for each other. And I tell my friends, too, okay, when you get your show, hire me, because we don't know what's around the corner, and that's okay. 1, you know, and I'm going to enjoy it while it's here. Yeah. Well, in that vein, Robin, I want to, too, say thank you for saying yes. Thank you for saying <laughs> yes to You're me. You're welcome. Truly, yeah. thank you for saying yes to me and for always reminding me of who I am and where I'm headed. Thank you, Yay. Robin. We did it. We did it. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> For this week's Sankofa moment, Robin shouts out the historical figures who had the nerve to be original and had vision for themselves and the rest of us. Her answer after the credits. Thank you for listening. This podcast is produced by LWC Studios for OWN. The show's executive producer is Juleka Lantigua. Its senior editor is Verilyn Williams. Our sound designer is Cedric Wilson. Our managing producers are Camille Stennis and Paulina Velasco. Our assistant producer is Lauren Francis. If you've enjoyed listening to this episode, please make sure to subscribe, leave a rating, and review wherever you listen to podcasts to ensure you hear the next one. Who is your throwback crush? When I say throwback, I'll give you an example, right? I live for Booker T. Washington, <laughs> and I'm living for Benjamin. <laughs> Go away! I can't! No! Booker T. Washington and Benjamin Banneker are like my like, you know, if I was back then, you know, during that time, I think they were okay. handsome. They were smart. Uh, yes. You know, I'm into them. So who, I'm very curious as to who yours might be. Malcolm X. Yes. Uh, you said that Malcolm like. Malcolm X, he was fine. Yeah. <laughs> he was yeah. so fine. Like if we're just talking about looks, you know, I'm like, <laughs> oh, Malcolm X all day. All day, no question, nobody else, the next question. <laughs> like, you know. Oh my goodness. Okay. <laughs> fine. And I usually, I usually don't go for light-skinned people. <laughs> um, I'm light-skinned. So I'm like, I don't want another light-skinned dude. We're, we're just both over here getting burnt in the sun. Like, you know. But 